First International Baptist Church of Trenton, New Jersey. The church where everybody is somebody in Christ is head. This is a warm welcome to join us for our Rima encounter. A time of spirit empowered, inspirational, practical, and participatory engagement with the word of the living God. Rayma Encounter is about cultivating the grace to hear God's word, God's Rayma, for our lives, our walk, and our faith. Join our pastor, the Reverend Victor G. Cohn, for an exciting time in the word. Thanks for tuning in. Please share this video and do stay tuned. God bless you. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Thank God for giving us another opportunity. Giving us another opportunity to carry away with this edition of dropping little nuggets. Of dropping as wow, I didn't say dropping little nuggets. I'm thinking about probably thinking about dropping little nuggets. This is our Rayma Encounter. This is our Rayma Encounter and um we are grateful. We are grateful to God for the opportunity we have to come your way today to just be able to um, share with you on what we began last week. We have been talking about the blood of Jesus, the significance of the blood of Jesus. So um, we'll just take a few moments, listen to a few bars of the, of this song by Duncan O'Yinkin. It's titled Absolutely Nothing. We have no copyright to this song. As we listen to it, we'll just take a few moments to wait for others to join us, and then we will start, jump right into what we have for today. Amen. Please, please stay tuned.
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We are privileged, we are honored, we are blessed to be here tonight. So please share the, share the link, share the video, share this link. We are doing, we are on a second part, we are on a second part of this teaching on the significance of the blood of Jesus. Yes, we sing it, we've seen it a lot of times. There is power in the blood, there is power in the blood. And so tonight, by the grace of God, we have the honor, we have the privilege of completing this round of teaching. Praise the Lord. We hope we're gonna have the time to finish off tonight. In the meantime, um, the, the we want to ask you to please click on the link in the title of this broadcast on our Facebook page, please click on the link. I'm trying to share the link with others as well, but please click on the link so that as you do it, when you make your comments, your comments can show up in the feed directly. Amen. Please, we appreciate it. You can just do that for us. Just click on the link so that as you comment, your comments can appear directly in the feed. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We give God the glory, we give God the honor. We don't have copyright to this song. There's a song by Dunsen Oyiken. It's called Absolutely Nothing. And I think it's a befitting testimony, it's a befitting tribute to the Lord Jesus, the one who gave his precious blood for us on the cross of Calvary with whom Apart from Jesus, we are absolutely nothing. Amen? Yes. Apart from Jesus, we are absolutely nothing. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you tonight. All I have is what you gave me. Yes. All I am is who you made me. Hmm. Absolutely nothing without you. Ooh, absolutely nothing without you. Absolutely nothing without you, Jesus. Yeah. Absolutely nothing without you. All I have is what you give me. Yes, Lord. Who I am is what you made me. Absolutely nothing without you. Ooh. Absolutely nothing without you. Absolutely nothing without you, Lord. Oh, absolutely nothing without you. All I have is what you give me, Jesus. Who I am is what you made me. Absolutely nothing without you. Oh, Lord. Absolutely nothing without you. Yes, Lord. Is this your testimony today? Can you can you declare today that we are that you are absolutely nothing without the Lord Jesus? This is not just a song. This is a revelation. This is a reality. This is a rhema. Remember, Jesus said this in John chapter 15. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Everything we have accomplished in our lives, every every stride we've taken in our life, every step we have, we have, we have reached in our life, every blessing we have experienced in our life has never been because of our prowess or because of our proficiency. It has been because of the grace of God, because of the amazing goodness of the Lord Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah, Jesus. We are nothing without the Lord. Absolutely nothing without you. All I have is what you give me. Who I am is what you made me. Absolutely nothing without you. Oh, absolutely nothing without you. Oh, Jesus, we bless you tonight. 
Absolutely nothing without you, my God. From the depths of our heart, we say, Absolutely nothing without you. Absolutely nothing without you. Oh, God, you are our everything. We say, We absolutely nothing without you, God. Mm. Absolutely nothing without you. I don't hear what anyone say. I'm nothing without you, God. Mm. Absolutely nothing without you, God. Yes, Lord. Absolutely nothing without you. Mm. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Mm. Yes. What a befitting tribute, what a befitting way to start this, this Rema encounter tonight. We are discussing part two of the blood of Jesus. We're discussing part two of the significance, the power and the significance of the blood of Jesus. And so tonight we just we just want to we just want to worship the Lord. We just want to worship Jesus and just thank him for the privilege that we have to be called children of God. The, 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 the medium by which we, ha we, we have been granted this privilege has been because his blood was shed. Oftentimes we sing the song, there is power, there is power, wonder working power in the blood. But do we really understand what we mean when we are singing this song? You know, oftentimes we, we, we say, would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood. Do we really understand? Does it really minister to us? Has the Spirit of God really opened our eyes to understand the significance of the blood? The blood that was shed 2,000 years ago in the blood that has never lost its power. Have we really come to, the, to grips with the importance of the blood and the power of the blood that is working on our behalf today? And so tonight, this is what we are going to be discussing. And it's my prayer that you will, you, will be, you will be good to us. You will share this link. You will share this link. You will invite others to join. You will invite others to tune in. Discussing. And it's my prayer that you will be, in, 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 encourage others to please tune in, to please join in. And again, we want to ask you also, please don't forget to click on the link so that it makes it easy for us to be able to access your comments as you click on the link as you click on the link it makes it easy for us to be able to see your comments directly so we want to encourage you please click on the link it's just a blue title the blue writing um under the broadcast under the description of the broadcast where it says to participate click on this link and you see the http right there on our facebook page i beg you please click on that link and then you should be able to access you should be able to access we should be able to access your comments directly amen let us start with a prayer gracious god we thank you for this opportunity we thank you for this moment god this is a privilege that has been given to us we can have nothing if you have not given it to us if you did not grant us life today if you did not grant us this responsibility if you did not give us the the health oh god if you did not give us the information if you did not give us the empowerment if you had not anointed us we would not be here tonight if you did not create the, the medium of technology for us to use God to come to your people today with the grace and the glory and the beauty of your word we would not be here tonight and so god we pause this moment to give all the glory and the honor to your name to the name of jesus the supreme name that is above every name we ask now god that you will fill this moment you will saturate this atmosphere with your power and your presence we plead tonight by the blood of the lamb we plead tonight by the blood of the lamb that god your spirit will take preeminence it was for this reason that you died father we pray that lord we will not miss out on the purpose and the power of your blood and i god your people will grow in deeper understanding and deeper communion with you oh god i thank you to now have your way now with us we are vessels but god we are empty vessels cleanse us fill us to overflowing deposit your revelation in the hearts of your people and god let there be a transformation tonight in the name of jesus amen 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 so um we're grateful to god we're grateful to god for this opportunity to be here 
we are discussing the significance and the power of the blood. Um, last week when we started, we took some time to read a passage of scripture from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9. And then we went on to show some, 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 we went on to look at the medical, you know, what, what, what uh, signs have discovered concerning the importance of the human blood, the role, the very vital role that, 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 that the blood plays in the human body. And we try to show the wisdom that God has by virtue of the fact that God esteems the blood so highly. We see from Genesis, you know, throughout scripture, how God has constantly been employing the blood and God has been constantly using the blood, you know, constantly. And so we and so we we, we, we went on to show the connection. We will probably do a little bit about that as a means of recap. But um, this subject is so important. As I was preparing this, this was the insight that hit me, you know. The, the word, the word, the word that hit my, my spirit is, is the word that, that says that whatever you have as a person, whatever you have and you do not know that you have it, whatever it, whatever that is yours, whatever that is your possession, and you do not know that it belongs to you, that possession belongs to you, is something that you could be robbed of, it could be stolen from you. You could be bullied, and frightened to give it up, and you wouldn't fight back because you didn't know that it was yours. So the reason why this subject, this discussion is absolutely important is because you as a child of God need to come to the place of understanding the power of the blood. Because by the grace of God, when you come to the place of understanding the power of the blood, then you can tap into the realms and you can tap into the benefits of the blood. And experience on this side of eternity the blessings that accompany the blood. I want to also say this in opening <clears throat> that all of life is spiritual. Every dimension of life is spiritual. Every dimension of life is spiritual. This is the reason why when you when you open your mouth and you pray to a God who you don't see, and you pray to this God and you earnestly and fervently pray to this God who you have not seen, who is not physical. You yet can experience a testimony after some time by the interposition and by the intervention of God in, in granting what you've prayed for. You can tell somebody, I prayed and I asked the Lord to do so and so for me. And God was consistent in doing so and so in my life. I don't know about you if you've, if you had, if you've had experience, but I can definitely tell you that there, are, there have been moments and times in my life, especially when I came to faith initially, and I was trying to gain clarity concerning the call of God upon my life because I did not just want to go into ministry just because everybody was saying, well, you know, go into ministry. No, I wanted to hear God clearly for myself. And I went to God and prayed some specific prayers that could not have answered, could not have been answered by coincidence. I prayed some specific prayer that today, if I had the opportunity, maybe I would not pray that prayer again. Because today in retrospect, it almost looked foolish. But, you know, I love the Bible. The scripture says God is able to take the foolish things of the world and confound the wise. In that state of my of my of my spiritual ignorance, I had the audacity to pray that radical prayer. But in the grace and the wisdom of God, God specifically answered every one of those prayers and granted me the convincement that I needed to know that the hand of God and the call of God was upon my life. And it was in that moment that I resigned and re and, re and, re and, re and surrendered my 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 my, my strivings. And my, and my fightings with God, I resigned them to God's will. And I said, have your way. So the question is, do you know, have you come to the place of understanding the power of the blood? Because again, like I said from the beginning, whatever that is yours, whatever that is your possession, but if you do not know that it is yours, it is something that the enemy could rob you of and you will not really take advantage of the fact that you've been robbed of that thing. So we're talking about the power of the blood. And as, we, and as we prepare ourselves and as we go through this time tonight, as we discuss um, this important subject, I want us to read our focal passage. It's a lengthy passage. It's a, it's a lengthy passage. But I, I want you to listen, not just with your ears, but I pray that you listen with your heart. I pray that you listen with your heart. 
the ninth chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number nine, and beginning at verse number 11, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. Hebrews chapter nine, beginning at verse number 11, and we read through the end of the chapter. There it says, but when Christ came as a high priest, when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that, that have come, he went through the greater and the more perfect tent that was not made by human hands and that is not a part of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he went into the most holy place once for all and secured our eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and of bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who were unclean purified them physically, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciences from dead works so that we may serve the living God? There is something about cleansing that gives us the compulsion, that gives us the drive, the desire to want to serve. When you when you notice and you find yourself in the realm of 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 of, of struggling to serve God, when you when you when you come to a place where your heart no longer beats and there is no longer a, a drive in a, in a burning passion to want to serve God, you better be checking to find out whether you are truly clenched or whether there is something that is still pulling you back to stay in the muck and the mire of your yesteryears. Here the scripture is clear. Chapter 9 and verse 14. It says, how much more than will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, who offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciences from dead actions so that we may serve God. The, the essence of our cleansing is for our consecration, is for our commitment. Hallelujah. Further down in verse 15, the text goes on and says, this is why the, this is why Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. So that those who are called may receive the eternal inheritance promised them since a death that has occurred redeemed us from the offenses that were committed under the first covenant. 16 goes on to say, for where there is a will, the death of the one who made it must be established. Here, the, here the idea is like, if you've written your will and your testament, as long as you're alive, that will is no longer in effect. But when there's a death, then your will comes alive. Your lawyer will, will then begin to affect your will you know, and, and, and implement what is what is written in the will. You will understand what we are getting to in a moment. You understand what we're getting to in a moment. Verse 18 says, this is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without the shedding of blood. Now, there was an old covenant. And today in Christ Jesus, there is the new covenant. All right. So even the old covenant, we're talking about significance and the power of the blood, even the old covenant was not rectified, was not brought into effect without the shedding of blood. Unfortunately, though, under the old covenant or, 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 or under the old covenant, the, the, the blood that was shed was the blood of goat and of bulls. But under this new covenant, the blood that was shed is the superior blood of Christ himself. Wow. Verse 19 says, for after every commandment in the law, have been spoken to all the people by Moses. He took the blood of the calf and the goats together with some water and, and the scarlet wool and he and with a branch of hassle, he sprinkled the scroll. That is the Ten Commandments, the instruction they have received from God. And he also sprinkled it upon the people. And he said to them, this is the blood of the covenant that, or, that God ordained. The blood of the covenant that God ordained. So the blood was a, was in, was was a medium that was ordained by God. It was not just something that somebody imagined. I told you every aspect of life is important. I will tell you, I will tell you why as we go along. All right. So the blood that God, the covenant, the blood of the covenant that God ordained for you. In the same way, he sprinkled the blood on the tent and upon everything that was used in the worship. In fact, under the law, verse 22, in fact, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Therefore, it wasn't necessary 
for those earthly copies of the things in heaven to be cleansed by these sacrifices. But now when it comes to the heavenly things themselves, these are made clean with a better sacrifice than these. Verse 24, for the Messiah, for Christ, did not go into the sanctuary that is made by human hands, that are merely a, a copy of the truth that is to come, but he went into heaven itself. And he appears now at God's presence on our behalf. Nor did he go into heaven to sacrifice himself again and again. The way the high priest go into the holy place every year with the blood that is not his own. Verse 26. Then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the creation of the world. But now at the end of the ages, he appears once for all. He, he has appeared once for all. That he may remove sin by his sacrifice. Talking about the death of Jesus. Indeed, just as people, just as it is appointed unto a person once to die and after this the judgment, so also Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. He will appear again a second time. Not to deal with sin, not to, not to provide an atonement for sin, not to provide a remedy for sin, because that has already been, been provided. So this also further amplifies the power of the blood. If something is so effective that, that for one application, that thing continues to remain in effect for thousands of years, then you know how powerful that thing is. How sufficient that thing is. So he goes on to say, so the Messiah was, so the Messiah also sacrificed himself once to take away sins for many people. And he will appear a second time, this time not to deal with sin, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly wait for him. Who eagerly wait for him. We're talking about the power and the significance of the blood. Basically, in summary, again, part of the reason why we're doing this, part of the reason why we're going through this discussion is because in the month of July, according to the liturgical calendar of the church, the, 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 the focus is on the blood of Jesus, it's focused on the blood of Jesus. And so this is why we are going through this teaching. All right. Now, what does the Bible teach about blood in general? What the Bible teaches about blood in general, and then we're gonna we're gonna just deal with that for a little bit, and then we're gonna switch on to show how it connects to the blood of Jesus and why that is important for us today. All right. So let, let's talk a little bit about about the blood, about the blood from a general perspective. The common, you know, blood blood is described. You know, when you read the Bible, be it the Old Testament or the New Testament, blood, you know, is often used to describe, often used to designate that common starting place of all humanity, right? Uh, when when the, when, the, when the King James Version translates Acts chapter 17, verse 26, where it says, from one blood, he has made all nations of dwell on the face of the earth. That is a, that is a poor translation. That is a poor translation. Because when you go back to the Greek text, there is nowhere in the Greek text that the word haima is mentioned. Haima in the Greek is the word for blood. The word that is used in the Greek text is, is, is the word henos. Henos. Now, henos is the word for one. The text reads, epoisen te ek henos, which means, so then he has made out of one. It just the word that henos is the word one. And then it goes on to say, Pan ethnos, like all nations, all nations, all tribes, all nations, all tribes, right? So, so the so the text is actually he has made out of one. Now, because there is no other word that is supplied there, it just says he has made out of he, he has made out of one, you know, all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Translators try to fill in for context and for readability so that we will get the idea. And so that's how the King James supplied the word from one blood. All right, but other translations will say from uh, from one ancestry, which is I think a better translation. But either way, whether you take it to mean whether you take it to mean blood or you take it to mean ancestry, the truth of the matter is that you know we we the, the life that causes birth, you know, that causes us to have breath in us, that life comes from the blood, so to speak, and, and it comes down through our lineage. So pretty much. You know, same ideas, but just different ways of expressing them. So, in a way, you know, it doesn't take away from the overall essence of the of the truth of the of truth of the scriptures. I just want to stress that. All right. So, basically, what did, what the Bible talk about blood? The first one of the first things the Bible talks about blood is that the, is that blood is the basis of our common 
have common human heritage, right? Now, this is this is why when you read a scripture like this, you know, then you 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 you, you get to appreciate you get to appreciate the wisdom of God, and you and you and you why the scripture encourages us to love one another, and then you tend to see the foolishness, and you tend to see the the the, the idiocy of of things like racism and things like hatred. You know where people think that the you know that you are less because of the color of your skin when in reality the bible and science points back to the fact that we have a common lineage a common heritage today if you were to take a knife and you cut a, a brown skin person or black bodied person and you cut a white bodied person or an asian or european you will notice that the color of the blood that comes out will not be pink and another brown so you see, the wisdom of God allowed it, the wisdom of God orchestrated the events of things so that even though we may be different on the outside, but internally we are one, depicting and describing the fact that, right before our eyes, describe the, the fact that we have a common ancestry, a common ancestry. So the blood is often used to describe our common human heritage. And so when we sing this song, you, my brother, you, my sister, in reality, we, 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 you know, it should have a little bit more meaning, especially when we think about it in light of the blood. Yes, when you bring the blood under a microscope, you are able to discover and distinguish differences. When you, when you do a microscopic view of the blood, you can see distinct, you can see distinctions and differences. But essentially, the makeup of the blood in whether the white person or the black person, essentially, the makeup of the blood is pretty much the same. Secondly, if you go to John chapter 1, verse 3, verse, excuse me, verse 13, there, when Jesus, when the Lord Jesus is talking about, when the Lord Jesus is talking about the new birth in John chapter 1, or John is actually talking about the, 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 the new birth, he says, when the, when the Messiah came, he came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to be called the sons of God. In verse 13, he says, who were born? Who is he talking about? Those who became the sons of God. Those who received the power to be called the sons of God. He, he wants to qualify the statement to make us to realize that, you know, you were not just called. It's not just empty words that somebody came to, to you know, to lavish upon you and say, okay, now I'm calling you a child of God. No, he says when that declaration is made, that declaration being called a child of God, that declaration is backed by transformation. And so he, he described the transformation in verse 13 when he says, who were born not out of the will. No, he says, he said, which were born not out of blood in a Greek text, not out of blood, high mind, the Greek the word I was telling you about, not out of blood, neither out of the will of the flesh. You know, like somebody had an urge to want to have intercourse with a, with a lady and impregnation happened and then you were born. So so you think that, you know, it, it, your, your conception, your coming to being happened because of the will of the flesh. No, he's saying before then, Something was already at play, a greater force. I told you every aspect of life is spiritual. So before, you know, when you open your mouth and declare Jesus as Lord, and you confess him as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you asked him to come into your heart, and you meant it, God also meant that, that meant, meant uh, uh, what God said. And so God brings you into harmony. So he said, not even of the will of man, but of God. Again, you see the word blood used there in verse 18 of John chapter 1. What does that point to? It points to the common human nature. It points to a common human nature, building upon what we also talked about from Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Now, since every human being, since every human being in the world today has been impacted, have been influenced by the male's ability to cause impregnation, right? Nearly every human being in the world today has is here because of the ability of the male to cause impregnation, right? And since our forefather Adam sinned against God and his reproductive ability became corrupted by sin, it is the reason why we carried the DNA of Adam. We carry the sinful nature of Adam. So when John is speaking here and telling us of the power of the transformation, he says this time around, the blood that was inherited from Adam that was corrupted is not what carries us. But now we are born out of God. In a Greek text, it's, 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 in a Greek text, it says, but out of God. 
We are born out of, we, we, the new birth brings us out of God. God is like God literally births us. So that means we carry the spiritual DNA of God. And it is not by the blood or the will of the flesh or of the husband, the male, you know, andros in Greek. It's, it's not, it's not any of those things. All of those things were factors that played out in, in our first birthing. But in the second birth, you know, through the power of the blood of Jesus, now we are born of God. We are birthed out of God. And it is safe, therefore, to say if you are a child of God, then that you carry the DNA of God. You carry the DNA of God. And the DNA of God, I would dare to say that the DNA of God is so profound, it's so powerful that it nullifies, it cancels out the impact of the Adamic nature that was corrupting us, that was destroying us and causing us to go to hell. We can go on to talk about, we can go on to talk about the blood. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 6 and verse 22, there it, you know, it focuses on, you know, the, where, where God is, where the prophet is using the imagery of the child being laying there in the filth and in the blood. And, and there the idea of blood can represent human wickedness, human depravity and human weakness. That word depravity can mean wickedness on the one hand, and it can also mean weakness on the other hand. So it's like we are stuck in our sinful nature and, and and we and therefore the good we don't the good we want to do we do not do right but the evil we do not want to do we keep finding ourselves doing it over and over and we are helpless to break ourselves free from this shackle of sin hence the apostle paul asked the question who then will redeem me will free me from this who then will free me from this life and he says thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our lord jesus christ all right, so the blood can also represent can also represent our human depravity, and that word depravity just means our human wickedness and our human weakness at the same time. We are wicked, and we are weak in that we cannot free ourselves. And somebody will say, "Well, but I'm not wicked. You know, I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't. You know, I don't. I've never taken a knife to cut anyone's throat. Throat. Good for you. Praise God for you. Thank God for that. Right." But the analogy I'd like to use to help us understand this is that there is no way we can exonerate ourselves. There is no way we can blow our own trumpet and declare of how righteous we are, if not for the grace of God. Why? Because righteousness is not determined by action. Original righteousness is not determined by action. Let me try to explain what I'm, what I'm, what I'm trying to say. I like to use the analogy of, of the water. If you took clean water, crystal clean water, and you put the water in a dirty cup, the water will still be dirty. So you see, people can say, I am born of the Adamic nature. And as far as I'm concerned, I've never lied, I've never killed, I've never done any of these horrible things, and, I, and, and this makes me good enough. But because you come from that lineage, because you come from that, from that lineage, all your actions can be compared to the clean water. But because those actions of not lying, not stealing, not doing any of these horrible things are, are, are manifested out of a lineage, out of a life that is connected to Adam, you are infected. And sometimes the way that the way that the way that you know that depravity shows itself is just by the fact that you've come to the place of not acknowledging that you have a need for God. You think that you can renovate your life by yourself and you don't need God's help. That's spiritual arrogance. The last I checked, Peter had the same audacity. He stood before Jesus and said, I would do this for you, Lord. I got a strength and I can do this and I can do the other. And Jesus says to him, the peak that you would have denied me three times before the cock crows. So God, listen, God will never lie when God's word challenge us, challenges us and convicts us of our human sinfulness. And so when we come to that place of thinking that we are righteous because of our actions, we miss the mark. We, 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 we fail to realize that the problem was there before we even became conscious to start practicing a certain kind of thing. And this is why the breath of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, which is the medium by which we become born into the family of God, the blood goes back to the beginning, editing out the virus that have been injected, the virus of sin, and deleting it out of our system and recreating a new system. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 17. Therefore, if any man, any woman, boy or girl be in Christ, he, she is a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. 
So the blood from the biblical perspective can also refer to human depravity and human weakness or human wickedness and human weakness. But if you go to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 and 14, you will also see that the Bible can also pre present the blood to show us that the blood is the foundation of life. The essence of life. So God will tell the Israelites, do not, you know, if you if you if you're to eat the animal, you ought to slaughter it so that the blood can ooze out, pour out of it before you can cook the meat and eat it. But if you went in the forest and you saw an animal already dead, maybe it's strangled and dead and it, and it died, don't eat it because the blood is still in it. So it's the, the life is in the blood. It's using that to show them, to depict to them some spiritual lessons that the foundation of life is in the blood. Look at a man, well built, 350 pounds, muscular, well built, physically fit. So strong that this dude can lift like 400 pounds of weight and, and carry like a piece of cake. Strong, strong back, strong muscles. Great, tough guy. But if you, if by some means, if by some medium, if God forbid, by some medium, one of his major arteries were cut and, 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 and the bleeding was not arrested soon enough, he, his strength, he begins to lose his strength. He begins to get weak. He 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 begins to lose his vision. He's unable to see, and and if nothing is done on time, he dies. Why? Because life is in the blood. The essence of life is wrapped up in the blood. And so, when you when your blood when your blood is low, critically low, then the doctors, then you're in trouble. The doctors got to figure out a way to either give you a blood transfusion, you know, and to arrest the situation, and then put you on some serious dieting and some serious medication to help to build your blood because the life is in the blood. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 and 14. Also, the Bible talks about the sacredness of life. Genesis chapter 9, that life is sacred. Life is precious. All life is precious. All life is precious. All life is precious. This is why God does not hate the sinner. And this is why it breaks God's heart. I believe it breaks God's heart when Christian people who are supposed to be walking in the image and likeness of God hate sinners. Because even God who is perfect in holiness, God doesn't hate sinners. God hates the sin. But God loves them. God loves us, all of us, just the way we are. Because life is precious. God doesn't, the Bible says God does not delight in the death of the wicked. God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. Although God has decreed, although God has decreed that, you know, that, 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 that the punishment for sin is death, yet you see God will give people a long rope so that they will come to the place of repentance. Because life is precious, the sacredness of life. You also see, you know, we also see that from, that's if it, for reference for that is Genesis 9, Genesis chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, the sacredness of life in the blood. We also see that the blood is the divinely prescribed means for atonement. Again, in Leviticus chapter 10, chapter chapter um, chapter 11, verse 10 to 14. There God is saying to the Israelites, he has given to them the blood of atonement. He has given to them the blood to make atonement for their sins. And the word atonement, like my, my uh, uh, introduction to theology in undergrad professor, Dr. Bradley Brown said the blood is atonement, right? So at one meant a t o n e m e n t atonement he said it's like at one minute it's like the blood that brings us back into fellowship with god the blood that erases the enmity the hostility between ourselves and god adam and eve were running away from god because of their sin and to the point that they're so fig leaves but now god can engage with them god can interact with them because god has sold for them animal skin god has made for them animal skin so for God to do that implies that God had God was the first one to offer a sacrifice. So the blood is the means of, is the divinely prescribed means for redemption. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says there is no forgiveness of sin, right? The blood is also the basis of the new covenant. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. You also see that in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13. So the blood, this time around, the text we read earlier, it says that, if the blood of goat and of bulls could take away sin, there would have been no need for Jesus to give his life. So Jesus gave his life on a cross because his blood becomes the basis. He says, this cup is a new testament, a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Okay. 
And the blood can only the blood can only be a depiction. The blood can also be a depiction of sin, especially, you know, when that sin is a sin of murder. In Isaiah chapter 59, where God says, it is not that the ears of the Lord are heavy that God, you know, cannot hear us. It's not that God's hands are short that God cannot deliver. He said, but your sins have caused God to hide God's face from us and our, and our iniquities have caused God to not hear us when we pray. You know, and then God says in verse 3 that the hands are stained with blood. Hands are stained with blood. It's so easy for us to read passages like that and passages like that and say, well, this does not apply to me because as far as I'm concerned, I have never killed anyone before. But this is where Jesus, this is where Jesus does not make a distinction because Jesus shows us how profound sin can be, how deep reaching sin can be. When he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, you have heard it was said, it was said, do not murder. He said, but I say to you, whoever hates his brother without cause is just as guilty as a murderer. How much hatred is out there today? Sometimes amongst even the very people who call the name of God. They will not celebrate your victory, but they will look for, they will not believe, you know, when God has done amazing things in your life, they will not celebrate your victory, but they'll look for the least things that you've done to, to, to spread it all around and talk about how crazy and how terrible you are. And sometimes the reason is simply because what you've gained, what you've benefited, what you've been blessed with, they wish they had without realizing that you see no need to envy anyone under the sun. Because to everything, there's a time and a season to every purpose under heaven. So the blood can also be a depiction of sin. Hands being steamed with blood doesn't necessarily, it's sin. It doesn't necessarily mean you had to cut somebody's throat. Where there is hatred, you know, where there is pride, you know, where there is an evil eye, you know, where I just hit her. I can't stand her guts. You know, that, that's an indication that the blood of Jesus needs to be applied in that situation. Now, this leads us to talking about the blood of Jesus. What makes the blood of Jesus different from our blood or uh, different and what makes it significant is the, fact, is the fact that the Bible tells us, first of all, that the blood of Jesus is innocent. Judas, who betrays Jesus in Matthew 27, verse 4, he is the first one to acknowledge that he has betrayed innocent blood. The word innocent carries the idea of being of, 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 of carry the idea of being right, pure, free of defilement. So the blood of Jesus is innocent blood. Now this ties back to the Old Testament because the requirement was that the animal that had to die for the sins of the people had to be a lamb without blemish. Had to be a sheep without defect. It, you know, it couldn't. You couldn't bring a crippled sheep to offer it as a sacrifice for your sin. You know, you couldn't bring an animal that had a spot on it. It had to be a pure lamb. And that, that's that. That although they were using a physical animal then, yet that reality, that physical thing, I told you all of life is spiritual. That physical thing was pointing to the spiritual significance of the fact that Jesus is blood. Jesus' blood, Jesus' blood was innocent blood, pure blood. Now, if you know, I don't know if you if you ever thought about this, but have you have you ever asked yourself the question, how can Jesus be innocent? How can Jesus' blood be innocent when Jesus was born by Mary? Born through the womb of Mary. Have you ever asked yourself that question? How can Jesus, you know, how can Jesus be, how can the blood of Jesus be innocent? You know, when he was born of Mary, when Mary is his mother, you know, Reverend, I thought you said, you know, all of humanity is sinful. <laughs> so if he's coming through Mary, doesn't that, you know, create a means for him to be sinful as well? So if the Adamic nature, if the Adamic ability to cause impregnation is where the sin is. Hmm? Hmm? And. This Adamic nature produces or contains out of the X and the Y chromosome, right? Which means it's from this one ability to cause impregnation that you can either have a man or a woman child, a male child or a female child, right? Now, the, the female child can, you know, the female child, the female child is born. That means she carries what? The X and X chromosome, right? So when, when, when conception is about to take place, she has to release one chromosome, right? 
But because she has X and X chromosome, I mean, the only chromosome she can ever pro pro produce is the X chromosome. And then when the when the male, when the conception is about to take place and the male has released, you know, his ability to cause impregnation, he is out of, he will out of release an X chromosome or a Y chromosome, right? So, so, so now to, for the life of Jesus, you will notice that while Mary was still untouched, while she was still a virgin, says the scriptures, she was found to be with child. Conception had already taken place. Now, if this X chromosome merged with her, if this Y chromosome, excuse me, if the Y chromosome, the spiritual Y chromosome merged with her X chromosome to cause a male child to be in her womb, we can therefore conclude that the child was free of all defect because there, it, at this time, it is not coming from the original X or Y chromosome that is already contaminated by Adam. No. Hence, Jesus could be born through the womb of, a, of Mary and yet be on, on, untouched and, and uncontaminated by the defects of our human sinful nature. What a wisdom. What the, see, imagine the wisdom of God. Imagine the wisdom of God that Christ will be born through the womb of a, of, a, of a virgin girl who is not even touched. She asked the angel, how can this be seen? I don't even know a man. But if, if God could make that happen, then it means that God has already forethought the implication of Christ, this Christ, this one who will be the Lamb of God, as John called him, John the Baptist. The Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. So he's innocent. The blood of Jesus is innocent. That's the first thing I want us to realize. The blood of Jesus is innocent. The next thing is that the blood of Jesus is precious. Like Peter calls it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. He says, you were not redeemed with corruptible, with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious, in the Greek text is the word timaeus, the precious blood. That word precious there means something that is properly valuable as having recognized value. Unfortunately, not many of us recognize the value of the blood. This price that this price that there has never been in creation, and there will never be another like Jesus coming again through the womb of Mary, a virgin girl, without sin and dying. That just for the unjust, there will never be. And so on that basis, his blood surpasses. You know, the scarcer a thing is, the more valuable it becomes, right? The rare, the rare a thing, when something is very rare, the more expensive it is. Common economics will say, well, when you have excess surplus cash flowing on the market, what happens to the value of the cash? The value decreases. And when you have limited amount of cash on the market, you know, because it's hard to find, it becomes the value for it rises. So if, if there is no other blood in the entire universe like Jesus, then this confirms that Peter is right when Peter describes the blood of Jesus as being precious. Far more precious than gold, far more precious than silver, far more precious than precious stones, as we like to call it. The only Valuable currency that heaven recognized as the appropriate payment for the redemption of humankind. And the blood of Jesus was also necessary. Chapter 9 of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. 9, verse 22 and 23, where it says there, it says, in fact, under the law, almost everything is cleansed with blood and without a shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin verse 23 therefore it was necessary that if the earthly things which are a representation of the heavenly things had to be cleansed by animal blood more so now that it comes to the spiritual things jesus himself had to share his blood so when the old testament when the old covenant was established there was you know sacrifice moses had to kill, come, kill the animals spill the blood all over the everything to purify those things. I told you, everything is spiritual. It was like a physical action, but they didn't know that it was pointing to a future spiritual reality. So now, to rectify this new covenant, blood had to be shed. And the blood that was shed was the blood of Jesus. More than that, the blood of Jesus is not only necessary, but the blood of Jesus is also sufficient. 
the same nine of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter nine, look at verse 13 and 14. There it says, if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of heifer that was sprinkled on those who were unclean, if it purified them, then it means that, now here's the thing. Why do you think the, whole, the, the, the high priest who went into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, where if you were sinful, and if you went there, you would die instantly. And yet the high priest would carry the blood there and, 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 and present it before God symbolically and say, God, this is this blood of the animal that have been shared represents the sins of your people. So please have mercy on us. And why do you think he would go there and come out? Because the blood spoke and God honored the blood. The blood spoke and God honored the blood. So now if the blood by then made him acceptable so that his intercession would be effective for the people, today the blood of Jesus is even more superior than that blood, than the animal blood. Which means that when you come before God through the blood of Jesus, you stand justified before God as if you've never sinned before. You stand before God as if the holiness of Jesus is directly infused in you and God no longer sees you as you for your past, for my past. But God sees us in Jesus because of his blood. Sufficient. The sufficiency of the blood. But the blood of Jesus is also final. Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter, um, chapter 9, verse 24 through 28. There it also says, we also read it, right? He did not go into the sanctuary that was made with human hands, that was merely a copy of the true one, but he went into the very heaven itself to appear now in the presence of God on our behalf. He did not go into heaven, I mean, if nor did he go into heaven to sacrifice himself again and again. No, it was one time, permanent, done. Like the way the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies every year with the blood of, you know, something else, another animal that had been sacrificed. Now, if that was the same system, it didn't write us it, then Jesus was going to have to be repeatedly sacrificing himself. But he goes in, at the end of the age, he appears there once for all to remove all sin by his own sacrifice. Indeed, just as it is appointed a, a, a person once died after this the judgment, so now he sacrificed himself once for our sins or for the sins of the whole world. And he's coming again a second time. This time around, not to deal with sin, not to do blood business and sin no more. No, no, he's not. He's not. So the point here is that the blood of Jesus is the final payment, the perfect antidote, the perfect vaccine for sin. And this is the reason why the writer said, the, the writer, the, the writer of the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, is right when he says, "Now." is the time now is the accepted time because here it is if you if there is only one <laughs> you know people made trips out of the country and then the COVID 19 started getting started raging and then the airlines had to shut down and you couldn't travel if there was only one flight out of the country you know what you want to do you don't want to miss that flight you want to you if you if you're going to sit on a wing of the plane and strap yourself you want to sit there <laughs> you want to strap yourself and sit on the wing of that plane because you'd be like i ain't missing this right so now if we emphasize, you know, and focus on things that are on the finality of things, on things that are very limited, why are we waiting for? What are we waiting for to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Surrender to the cleansing of his blood and let the power of his spirit come alive in us today. What are we waiting for? Are we saying to ourselves, well, I will live and I'll get a little bit older and I will surrender my life and I'll be truly committed? What if we don't have the opportunity? So the blood of Jesus is important because, one other reason is because it is final. It is the final payment. There will never be another blood like Jesus that will, that will, that will be shed again for the redemption. And that's why we sing there is power in the blood. Because that one payment that remains effective until Christ returns. That must tell you that the blood has power. To go to the lowest valley and to go to the highest mountain. And what is it effective to do? John tells us in 1 John 1, 7, cleansing. He said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, right? He said, and the blood of his son, Jesus, cleanses us. The blood of his son, the blood of Jesus is the basis of continual cleansing, even as we walk in fellowship with the Father. As we walk in fellowship with the Father, 
then it's an it's an it's an indication that the blood has cleansed us when you go to work you receive your compensation you receive your pay as you do the work you don't just stay home without telling the people telling your bosses why you stay home and then at the end of the time you get any money no it doesn't work like that so in the same way as we walk in obedience as we walk in fellowship with god there is a there is a there is a reciprocal reality that takes place a back and forth reality that takes place Number one, the reason why we are able to walk in fellowship with God is because the blood has already cleansed us and brought us into communion with God. And then the more we continue to walk with God, the more he continues to cleanse us. So it's a repeated process, like a recycling process. So we can't be complacent living out, living anyhow and call ourselves Christians, especially if we come to value this thing of the blood of Jesus. Because the blood is the basis of God reconciling us back to himself. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 to 16. So the blood is the basis of God reconciling us. The blood, in short, is important because it is the price of redemption. The price that has been paid to buy us back. When we fell into sin, Satan had the right to exercise dominion over us because he became the God of this world. So he became our boss automatically. But the price that has been paid, the redeeming blood of Jesus, now buys us from his domain. So the scripture says we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness. We have been brought into a new kingdom. There is a kingdom transformation, a kingdom transference. We have, trans we have been transferred from another kingdom to the kingdom of Jesus because of the blood. Because of the blood, you have the right to say, Satan, you don't have any authority over me no longer. I'm no longer in your territory. I don't, I'm not your citizen. I know my right. <laughs> I know my right as a child of the kingdom. So the blood is the price of redemption. The blood is the basis of justification. Justification simply means you have been declared right. There is an accusation against you that you did something wrong. You did something horrible. And you went to the court in the courtroom and it, and it was found that, yes, you were guilty. You deserve the punishment. And then somebody rises and the person says, I'm taking his place. If the judge will allow it and that person takes your place, justice cannot be served two times for the same crime. Yes, you committed a crime and you deserve the punishment, but because somebody else volunteered to take your punishment, justice is now fully served and the judge can knock his gavel and let you go home free instead of going to jail. That you have been justified. This is what Christ did for us. And this is what the blood represents. The blood represents the fact that we have been justified. That in Christ we stand before God righteous justified not guilty why because god will not punish one crime or he will not punish twice one crime that has already been paid for and since it has been paid for in christ he will not punish you again especially if the blood is applied to your life why is the blood of jesus important because it is a price of redemption the final price of redemption because it's the base of our of our justification is also the means of, of our sanctification hebrews chapter 10 verse 20, 29 Hebrews 10, 29. There it says, how much more severe punishment do you think we'll receive from a person who deserves, how much more severe a punishment do you think that the person deserves who tramples on God's son and treats as a cheap thing the blood of the covenant by which we are sanctified and who insults the spirit of grace? He's talking about people who turn their back on Christ, you know, and give up on the faith. He's speaking in a hypothetical sense that when people, if people who disobeyed the law of Moses in old times experience a severe punishment, how, how much more you think will happen to people today who treat the blood of Jesus cheaply? See, it's because the blood is a basis of our sanctification. That word sanctification means this is what set you apart. The reason why we can't afford to live anyhow, we can't afford to just live any kind of life, is because the blood sanctifies. Jesus' blood sets us apart. Why you don't use your communion elements at your church for any ordinary purpose? Because the thing in your spirit, in your understanding is set apart for a unique purpose. In the same way, God is not just setting the vessels apart, those little cups that you use. No, God, the, the, the Bible is telling us from this verse, Hebrews 10, 29, that God has set us apart because of the blood. 
And like I said, the reason why, the reason why sometimes we live the way we live is because we don't understand the impact of the blood. So we live in hell. But here the scripture says, this is the means by which we have been set apart. We have been sanctified. God himself set us apart for his own purpose. You are not ordinary. You are not ordinary. You're not cheap. <laughs> You're not, you, you are the Sunday go to meeting <laughs> for God. Yes. You are in a class all by yourself. You are, you are esteemed in the heart of God. That's why he let his son go to the cross of Calvary for you and for me. The blood is also the base of our communion with the Father. When we, when we on, on first Sunday, when we have, when we break bread together and we eat the bread and drink the wine, we are having communion. But that communion means intimate union. It's a reminder that now, because of the blood, we have fellowship with the Father. You can call him morning, noon, night. At any time, and you know that he will be there. The blood has made you one with God and made God one with you. And finally, the blood is the basis of our eternal life. John chapter 6, verse 53 to 50, 53. John 6, 53 to 56. See, John chapter 6, verse 53 to 56. There, John, there the Lord Jesus says, So he said to them, Truly I tell you, of em I tell you of truth that unless you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you don't have life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day because my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. The person who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. I mean, obviously, Jesus was not referring to us becoming carnivals, right? Go be carnival, be looking for Jesus' body and Jesus' blood, eating raw human flesh and drinking his blood. That was not the idea. But Jesus was saying that those who, come, who, who become one with him, you know, who enter a covenant with him, when he broke bread symbolically, he said he gives us eternal life. Eternal life. Beloved, are you grateful for the blood? Are you grateful for the power of the blood today? Are you grateful for the power of the blood of Jesus and for all that it means and all that it has made available to you today? We thank God for the blood. We thank God for the blood. We thank God for the blood of Jesus. And we thank God for all that it represents. In a day and time, you know, when 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 so many things have lost its value, when so many things have lost its, its significance, when spirituality and when righteousness is becoming decreased in the world today, may the Lord grant you the grace to not treat the blood of Jesus as a cheap thing. And as you think more, in, as you spend more time meditating on the blood, May, may the Lord help you to understand the impact of the blood in your life right now. So that the, the power of the blood can be manifested in your life. And in my life. So that together by the grace of God, our lives can truly bring glory to the one who gave his life for us. Somebody said, and I'm closing with this. Somebody said, if you went and told someone that your God is powerful, that your God can change life, that your God can heal, that your God can deliver. And the someone that you're talking to cannot see a transformation of the of, 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 of the power of this God in your life. Why should they believe you? When the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, all things have passed away, and all things become new. That's 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 a spiritual reality. But nobody can see spiritual things if the spiritual things are not manifested on the outside. In character manifested in our talking manifested in our actions manifested in our decisions if it's not manifested on the outside and people can't see it they will not believe it doesn't mean it's not true and so god is waiting the bible tells us that, the, that, that that even creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of god even creation is waiting for you to manifest who you have been bought to become who you have been paid for to become even creation is waiting for you because you have not seen the best of God yet. So may the Lord grant us grace to hunger for more of his presence, more of the power of his blood at work in our lives. Imagine, just, just think about some of the benefits of living under the old covenant. If you read Exodus chapter 23, verse 25, the Bible says, and you shall, and you shall serve the Lord your God, Exodus 23, 25, right? You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and he will take sickness from the midst of you. That was under the old covenant. 
part of the benefit of living in obedience to God in the old covenant was that they would, God would bless their bread and the water. God would take sickness from the midst of them. There would be no barrenness among them. Nobody would die before their time. They would live their right old years. Now, if that was true under the old covenant, what kind of blessing you think is under the new covenant today? What kind of blessing you think you inherit by virtue of your access to the blood? What kind of blessing you think you have today? I wish I could find a way to just drive this thing to you in a way that it would stir something in your heart to say, God, let the power of the blood come alive in me today. So that we never take the blood of Jesus for granted no more. And that by your grace, my life will reflect that I have been bought. That I'm not cheap. I'm not ordinary. I am the property of heaven. I have been, the blood has translated me from one kingdom to another. I now live under a new authority, a new management. We can only do what we can do. And the spirit of God, we have to do what the spirit of God we have to do. But thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And I pray that God will take these feeble words of mine. And that God will write them on your heart in such a radical way. And stir some things in you. Stir a fire in you. Stir a longing in you. That only God can feel. And if you're yearning for that, I want you to know tonight that every resource has already been paid for because the blood has been shed. The blood has been shed. God bless you in Jesus' name. If you got questions, if you got questions or comments, you can raise your questions. You can raise your questions. And um, we can, we'll try to answer them. We'll try to address them. We'll try to address them. Do you have any questions or do you have any comments? Do you have any questions or do you have any comments? Do you have, a, do you have any questions or comments? If you got questions? Do you have questions or comments? Um, Okay, so from what I'm seeing here, I just see comments. Um, Mother Nancy Richard and others are saying, "Yeah, I don't see any. I don't see any question. I don't see any question. I just see comments. 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 I just see comments." Praise the Lord. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Okay, so there is, okay, praise the Lord. You know, when you teach and you don't have, sometimes you wonder, it's like, wait, did I really teach? <laughs> you know, you wonder, you say, wait, wait, did I really, did I really do, you know, did I really get the message across? Did people really understand it? Or, you know, did people get lost in the midst of everything that was being said and they don't, they don't say anything? But I, I don't wear, I'm, I mean, I'm trusting. I'm trusting that if there are no questions, then hopefully, yeah, preferably, maybe it was clear enough for you, and you don't need, you know, you got, the, you got the point, you got a heart and the message of the importance of the blood and what it means to you today. Okay, um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you for making time. We are still observing the social distancing, but we're trying to take advantage. We're trying to take advantage of the opportunity that we have. Uh, New Jersey, the New Jersey Authority, New Jersey State um, Authorities have given up 25%, you know, 25% access to places, close up spaces for a limited amount of time. And so on Sunday, by the grace of God, we will be returning to church, but we will not be in full. We will be returning the leadership of the church. The worship team will be at the church. And we have already demarcated certain seats that will be so, so that we can create a social distance. By the grace of God, I'm working with the leadership of the church and we are going to put in place the hand sanitizers and want to encourage those who are coming you should please come with your mask if you come without a mask we'll be forced to give you one and you're going to have to wear a mask during, during the service by the grace of god um we're going to be doing a temperature check at the door we're not going to be it's not a physical thing that we have to touch you, you no know, we're going to use the, the infrared thermometer so we can measure the you know the temperature when the temperature is above 98 we're going to have to ask you to pl please go back and quarantine or go to the hospital we'll come visit you afterwards after we worship um Families coming to church with kids, you know, especially if you can't, if you don't have a babysitter, if you can't leave your kids anywhere and you have to bring the kids to church. We encourage you to please let the kids sit with you so that you can monitor them because, you know, the children also have a short attention span. We don't want them roaming all over the place. 
So let them sit with you so that if they need to go to the bath bathroom, you can take them there and come back. We'll make sure that there'll be a lot of sanitizing, you know, products at the entrance in the different place of the church so that, you know, we, we can all stay safe and we can all be well. All right. Sunday, by the grace of God, we, we will be coming your way again. But for our worship on Sunday, we're having a praise service. We're having a worship service, just praise and prayer. We just want to be a service of praise and prayer, of praise and prayer, telling God, thank you for how, how far the Lord has brought us. So please join us again on Sunday. We'll be coming your way. Those of you who cannot join us in um, for physical, who cannot come you with us physically, please join us online. We'll be also be here on, on our Facebook Live. And we pray that the service, there will be something in the service that will be a blessing to you. There will be a word. There will be a song. There will be a, a revelation. There will be there will be an impartation from God that will, that will bless you, that will, that will do something radical in your life. So join us on Sunday. But those of our members who are coming, those of our members who uh, um, who are coming, we want to encourage you to wear wear white. You know, if you can wear anything white, wear a white. Let's just come worship the Lord and just celebrate the Lord and just thank Him. It's not anything ritual. It, it's not a ritual to say, Pastor, we should wear white because wear white. Our sins are forgiven. No, <laughs> we know that sins aren't forgiven because you wear white. Your sins are forgiven because the blood of Jesus has been shared. Amen. It's just a means of just you know being in in unity and just just expressing ourselves and our love for one another and our love for the Lord. So please come wearing your white on Sunday by the grace of God. And um, again, we're trying to the seats. You will see the seats are already. We, we did some work to just arrange the seats, um, marking out certain seats that you can't sit in, so that people will create, will have the distance, the social distancing. All right. So God bless you. Until we come your way again on Sunday, and until we come your way again next week for another edition of our Very Mind Encounter. We pray God's rich blessings upon you and your family. May the Lord keep you safe, keep your family safe. And the Lord continue to bless you and use you and bring glory to his name through your life. In Jesus' mighty name, God bless you. I love you with the love of Christ. Stay faithful, stay serving, stay covered in Jesus' name. Amen.